Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Face to Face. My guest is a young man who is an ICT professional, but today considers himself more of a politician than an ICT professional, perhaps one of the youngest persons to make it into Ghana's parliament. He has spoken for the vice president, he has spoken for the president, and still continues to speak for a man who wants to become president of the Republic of Ghana. Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Samna T. George, is our guest on Face to Face. Welcome to Face to Face. Honorable Sabnati George, welcome. It's Thank a pleasure. You very much. I've been chasing you down for a while and I'm happy I finally caught up with you. Uh, it's not easy to catch a liar. <laughs> uh, very much so. But I always had to ask you this when did it dawn on you that it was going to be politics? Well, um, there had always been the dream from not quite a young age. When I was quite young, I wanted to be a pilot. Then, mm. after being a, wanting to be a pilot, I wanted to be a soldier. And then. Well, while I was in the university, I was still quite young. I was around 18. Around my 18th birthday, I said to myself that 13 years on, I was going to go into politics. I was going to contest for parliament. I said that to my roommate at the time. Um, but then I didn't know how and when it will happen. Then in 2007, I came back to Ghana to do my national service. I'd finished the university in 2005, but not done my service. Mm. So I came down to do my national service, and then the opportunity presented itself to do my national service in the office of the then vice president, Ali Mahama. Oh. Um, and so I ended up doing my national service. That was my first direct encounter with politics, and it happened to be at one of the highest levels in the office of the vice president. But then... Of the opposition party? Absolutely. Um, but... At the end of the day, I knew who I was. I knew what my identity was. I knew that I was pro-NDC. I'd made that point known to them. Even to do our national service that year, there were five of us. We had to go through a national security screening at Bluegate. The forms asked us our political affiliation. I stated there in black and white I was NDC. And it didn't but, matter? Well, I was, doing, I was just a service personnel. So I wasn't a major operator in the political landscape. But it allowed me to get proximity to... Ali Mahama's failed presidential beat uh, for the flag bearership of his party in, yeah. in 2007. And so I, I saw politics upscale or upfront at that level. Um, I got in touch with the man who has now become my predecessor, Honorable E.T. Mensah, and worked through him with Professor Mills' campaign um, on setting levels. And after that, uh, when Professor Mills took over office and made his appointments, there was a communication team that was set up and mm. I was drafted into that communications team to help with uh, party communication and government communications. And then that just brought me into mainstream politics. So I started the mainstream politics somewhere in 2008, 2009, but I became fully political in, in 2010. And that, that cost me quite some, some, some personal stuff because all of that time I was doing consultancy for the UNDP and World Bank. Mm through their uh, support to the government of Ghana, uh, their funded projects. I was doing a lot of the ICT work for them, which was giving me some good money. But by the end of 2010, going into 2011, when uh, we were to roll over the project, I was written to and told that I'd become politically exposed. Mm. And, and, uh, and for that reason, they could not continue to engage uh, me per se uh, on that level. And so I had to leave that and then focus on on the politics straight, straight strictly speaking, uh, cost me a few hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> some, some, some might say that <laughs> you, you moved on to a far more lucrative um, space, well, according well, to the Ghanaian well, well, perception that's Ghanian, of what that's politics Ghanian is. Perception, but I, 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 I have lived both lives and I made more money um, doing IT consultancy. IT consultancy is big. I mean, one project could be three hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand. You could get a number of these projects in a year. Um, in politics, <laughs> what's your salary? Except you choose to be corrupt, and even if you choose to be corrupt, it comes at a certain price. Mm. Again, in, in, in working in private practice, your money is your money. You choose who to help or who not to help. In politics, everything you get legally or legitimately is not even yours. You have conveyor belt for it because there are demands that come constantly from either constituents, if you're a member of parliament, or from party folk, or mm. even the general public, if you are a public service or public office holder, not necessarily a member of parliament, but maybe a minister or a presidential staffer, you get this request. And because you're political, you need to uh, find ways and means of, even at times, to your own detriment. So your money is your money when you're in private practice. Your money is not your money when you're in public practice. You, you, you talk about you being drafted into the communications team of President Mills when he came in. And I guess that is when you emerged onto the national picture yes. as uh, a politician for the for people who follow politics. Yeah. 
your reputation wasn't the most exciting. You were labeled as one of the babies with sharp teeth. Back well, in the day. Um, well, I, I think that the, if you look at the caliber of young men who were labeled as babies with sharp teeth, it's not the designation I shy away from. They're very, they're very sharp and You don't regret people. those days? They're, they're, no. Uh, get the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that I find myself in very good company. Mm. I mean, um, the, the caliber of young men who were described as babies with sharp teeth are people who have some of the finest intellect that I've met. So to be put in that category for me is, is a good thing. Ten years ago, it's from 2008 and I was about 11 years. Mm. 11 years, 10 years ago, nine years ago, um, my communication style and today are completely different. I mean, anybody who's going to want to be fair and objective would admit to the fact that even eight years ago, mm. six years ago, my interviews, my communication is completely different from what it is today because I've been, I'm a work in progress. I, I came into this job without having what you call maybe a formal communications background. I also came into this job with a setting history. I'd grown up in Nigeria. Mm. Um, the, the language of Nigeria is different. It's, it's more fiery. Um, as, a, as an individual, I have a fiery disposition also. And so there was a certain level of aggression that I came into this job with. Um, again, as a young man who didn't come from a political dynasty, I had to carve my own niche. And so survival needed or required some of those things. Would I repeat all of those things again if I was to start now? No. Interesting. All However, of you are simply say, are saying the same thing. I spoke to your good friend, the Honorable Okujota Blackwa, and he said basically the same thing. Sure. I mean, and, 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 and it, should, it should be a thing of, it's a good thing. Because if, I mean, Okujoto Blackwa is about three years my senior, age-wise. Mm. Um, but 11 years ago, or 10 years ago, he was a deputy minister of state. 10 years ago. He was not yet 30 at the time. Mm. You understand? We came into this thing quite young. And if 10 years on, we have not refined our style, if 10 years on, we've not gotten better, then there's something wrong with us then it means we've not learnt anything on the job. But this, this, this is actually testament to the fact that without seeking to blow our own horns, we are we're quite good material. We've been able to take feedback. We've been able to work on it. We've been able to evolve. Evolving is a very difficult thing. Mm. I mean, character traits are difficult to change. And so for us to have been able to work on it such that you would not see the kind of abrasiveness in my communication you saw eight years ago today. Mm. And even today, and it's because we've got people who watch us and, and we've been blessed to have people like that. The, the senior people who watch us on TV and after a TV show, they say, hey, you had good points, but your style of communication, your body language. I mean, at the time, Professor, um, President Mahama seconded me from the presidency to the Ministry of Communications to work with the Honorable Omani Buama. I wasn't very enthused about it, but it's one of the reasons why I feel indebted to President Mahama. He, 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 that was a stroke of genius. He put me under the tutelage of Dr. Omani Buama, and it's really done a lot to transform my communication. Omani Buama is one person who, after every day, will call me up and say, hey, you had a good show, but I didn't like your body language. You used this word. It wasn't right. You could have used this other word. And all of that kind of constructive criticism, people like Uncle Atu, Ahoy, Uncle Kwame Pepper. I mean, they would call you up and say, that was a good show, but you could have done this better. Mm. Uncle Sam Saka. I mean, a couple of people who will call me up and say, some are politicians, some are non-political people who just call you and say, hey, my bishop, Bishop Charles Ajinasare, mm. will call me and say, hey, boy, I don't like what you did today. You went down the road. I didn't like it. And all of that feedback has helped to shape who I am today. And I still think I'm not the finished article. I still think that there's still quite some work to do. And with the kind of guidance I get, I believe that, yes, we'll still get better. Did you grow up in Ingo Pram Pram? I came there for holidays. I didn't grow up there. I was born in Somanya. Hmm. Um, I was born in Somanya, and then I went to Nigeria at a very young age, around two years old. Okay. And I had most of my primary and secondary education in Nigeria. I, just came, in, I came back to Ghana in 2001 when I gained admission to tech. But what my parents did was that at least every year we came back home, we went hmm. back to Ningo. So it was a place holidays. you had a very close affiliation with? Very good affiliation with my, gran my grannies especially, um, my cousins, my uncles, my aunties, yes. So it wasn't difficult. I mean, even though I grew up in Nigeria, I could speak the Dangwe very fluently by the time hmm. I came back home because... It was the language we spoke at home. And upon making the decision to become a member of parliament, you chose the biggest fish in the pond to face, the Honorable E.T. Mensah. 
how, were you not scared at the prospect of facing off against a politician of that status at that point? Fear is not an emotion I know. Mm. Uh, strangely, I don't know whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing, but I mean, it's, it's an emotion that I have learned to master, maybe, if I put that way. Um, a lot of people are controlled by their fears, and their fears stop them from challenging the things that will take them to their next level. I mean, at times, my, my lack of fear has even come across as being stupid. For, for, for want of a better phrase. I mean, I also, West World God is an example we'll of it, that. you know, um, but things don't scare me. I mean, when I'm convinced that I need to do something, when I have a conviction, I have, I have a very strong sense of conviction. When I'm convinced that this is the route I want to go, mm. um, nothing, nothing stops me. And I've made the point severally that I fear no human being. I, I have no fear for any human being. I, the, the, the emotion I feel towards human beings is one of respect. Fear, I only feel maybe for the creator, but for human beings, no. And so going up against Honorable E.T. Mentor, I, I believe that nothing is impossible. I mean, the word impossible is I am possible. And so you just need to have the right framework. You just need to have, and my background as an engineer first has shaped my thinking. Everything must fit into a certain formula. So when I want to do something, I mean, my, my elections against Honorable E.T. was, it was scientific. I was able to do mm. presentations to people to make them understand why they should support my bid because there were 22 electoral areas, 11 in Pram Pram, 11 in Ningo. And when you take the results of my primaries with Honorable E.T. Mentor, he won 10 of the, he won in all out of the 22 polling stations. He won 11. I won 11. Mm. He won 10 in Pram Pram where he's from and won one in Ningo. I won 10 in Ningo where I'm from and won one in Pram Pram. So on that score, we're even. However, I, I had 66% of the votes and he had 34% of the votes because I said to them that, look, I will not be able to win all the electoral colleges, but I could identify the electoral colleges I will win in. And I showed how I would maximize. I had a system to help me maximize my, my margins of victory. And I had a system to help me minimize my margins of, 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 of loss in his area. So in the Pram Pram area, the 10 pulling stations I lost, I lost the biggest level of margin was about 284 votes. Okay, but you come to Ningo, for example, in my hometown in Ningo, where, where, which was one of the polling stations, I had 1,144 votes, he had 12. Hmm. So, I mean, most of the polling stations, I would win by over 500, 600 votes. So it was about focusing on my strengths. And that's how I go into elections. It must fit into a certain equation. You must know what your strengths are. Play up your strengths and try to minimize your, your weaknesses. For me, that's how I think. Hmm. And so everything fits into a certain a setting a, 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 a equation for me. Yeah. So has the relationship improved between yourself and Eti Mensa post that election because it was a very acrimonious primaries. Well, unfortunately, no. It's, it was acrimonious on his part. Um, I've expected and hoped that, as a senior statesman, he is. He would. He would have accepted his. I mean, and his. Did you reach out? Severally. Several, through several, my personally, through several people, opinion leaders. I mean, as a sports person that he is, uh, I expected him to know that in sports you either win or you lose and take it on his chain. But unfortunately, he's not taking this loss very well, and it shaped uh, a lot of his behavior um, for two years. Um, the rest of, I mean, the election was late 2015. The whole of 2016, I kept reaching out. The whole of 2017, I kept reaching out. In 2018, I took a decision that enough is enough. And that's the position I'm taking. I'm not going to reach out anymore. I mean, he's my constituent. I'm his MP. I would extend MP services to him if he so needs them. But outside of that, there's, there's no need for a personal relationship. Speaking about extension of MP courtesies and whatnot, Ningo Pram Pram, a lot of people say it's a, it's a district constituency with unrealized potential. How are you dealing with that in conjunction with your MCs and DCs and all the people? I, ha I have quite a good relationship with my DC. Um, uh, he happens to be a family member and, mm. and uh, just that like he's in the wrong party. Uh, but <laughs> we, we, there's, there's huge potential, huge, huge, huge potential for Ningo and Pram Pram. Unfortunately, a lot of that potential should have been harnessed before now. Because mm. you, you see, to harness the potential, you need to plan. Unfortunately, a lot of the planning has not been done. Pram Pram is basically exhausted now. There's, no, there's poor planning of Pram Pram. And that same problem is creeping into Ningo. And 
it appears that even the local authority is helpless in their ability to be able to enforce the planning rules because you realize that most of the lands we have a problem that our lands are not vested lands but they are they are they are held and they're not stool lands either they're held by clans and families mm -hmm. And so it's difficult for for enforcement of setting regulations. When you zone an area to be a commercial area, another to be a residential area, the, the family heads don't abide by those. They go ahead and do what they want to do. They sell the land, and Lands Commission would also go ahead and, mm. and give permits and all of those uh, title and permits are issued by the same district. And so, yes, there's a lot of potential that we have that we have not utilized. Is it possible to claw it back? It's going to be very difficult. I'm hopeful that we could do this. But you see, it goes beyond the MP and then the DC. It's actually a, a function of central government. Mm. Central government must have realized that when Accra started getting saturated, the first move was to the west of Accra, which was Kaswa. There was no planning for Kaswa. Kaswa has now become a very problematic area. When you speak to people who are involved in the security architecture of this country, they'll tell you the challenge, one of the major security challenges of Accra is situated in, in Kaswa. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because of the way Kaswa was not planned. And it's become some kind of unplanned area. Now, central government should have seen that with Kaswa getting saturated, the next move was going to be to the east of Accra, which is Ningo Pram Pram, starting from Pongkataman, so all the way to Ningo Pram Pram and Adana. Now, that also has not been planned for. And it's central government that has the power to be able to say that, look, we would enforce this as strict planning um, measures. They fail to do that. It's only when central government has a plan that a local authority, the DC, mm -hmm. can enforce that plan. But you don't expect the DC to be able to draw up such a national plan to, to regulate this. And so it's a failure of central government, and not just one government, but successive governments, to not have planned this out. And it's, it's, it's a problem. I was, I was up north over the weekend. I was in Bolga and Tamale. And you realize that growth is also beginning to happen there. We are not planning yet. You're beginning to see... Developments just spring up without any planning. As a country, we are failing to plan. We must have a full national development plan that is not just going to be about policies and economics and all of that, but even about spatial planning and proper planning of our settlements. Recently, we had um, some residents in your constituency block roads in yeah. the Dawenya area. Yeah. And they were not too enthused by the problems they've been going through. In fact, a lot of casual commuters or even on that route say it's one of the worst that we have in there. You've heard about this. It's a shame to us that in, in 2019 we have such a major road in Accra um, in such a deplorable state. Um, that road is a road that I have known for several years to be in several states of disrepair. There have been about eight contractors assigned to that road mm. in the last 15 years. Have you spoken to any and of them? The current contractor who is on the road, Simeen Ghana, has given all kinds of excuses why has not been able to get the work done. I think it's just a failure of it's just a failure of political will to get that road done. Because I mean, if if you see political will, and I've seen political will, if you remember that Sherman Road, a Sherman Apollonia Road, mm -hmm. that road was in a similar state of disrepair when President Muhammad decided he was going to get that road done. That road was fixed. That road got done. So it's political will. Roads are a matter of political will. Um, political will means you prioritize the road. You make sure the fund, funding is released to the contractor. I mean, I've had all kinds of excuses being given that the road was supposed to be a two-lane road. It's been made a four-lane road. And those are the reasons. All of that, forgive me, is claptrap. Um, we know what it is. The, the ministry was aware at the time that the expansion was done. In fact, that, led, that expansion led to the demolition of properties and payment of compensation. So it couldn't have happened on their blind side. The, the contractor had gotten to a stage in 2016. As candidate of, of the NDC, when President Mama came to commission the Saglimi Housing Project sometime mm. in, I think, September or October of 2016, I made him stop on that road and he committed to it and funds were released to the contractor at the time. The contractor actually moved in an asphalt plant because that road is an asphalt road. That asphalt plant was situated at the Dewu, the Dewu uh, work, work, work station just mm -hmm. before Central University, where and he brought in new equipment that he was supposed to use to, to, to do the, the road. But with a change of government and priorities shifting, you've seen a situation where um, the road has basically stalled. And the Minister for Roads, Honorable Amakwata, mm -hmm. has visited the site. He visited the site with me in October 2017. After several letters to him, he came to the site himself. He saw it. He committed to getting the road done. The, 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 I filed questions in Parliament. In fact, I showed him four roads. I showed him that road. I showed him the 
um, New Jerusalem to Apollonia Road. And when I showed him all of those roads, New Jerusalem to Apollonia, for example, had nobody on, no contractor on that road. He put a contractor on it after visiting my constituency. However, that's where the politics comes in. The Honorable Minister for Energy, Honorable John Pitamewu, lives in that area. The main mm. road has been abandoned, but the small link to his house is being done by the contractor. Are you sure? Oh, I mean, you can send your cameras there. I mean, this is not something that the residents themselves have called me to complain that, ah, why is the link road to the minister's house being fixed? And the main artery of the road is not being worked on. You get it. And it makes no sense. And I say it doesn't even make political sense for anybody to want to do this because it's so obvious what it is. Again, there's no way the minister would avoid the rough road, the rough artery. So why fix the small link to your house and abandon the main road? But these are some of the issues that people see and read politics into all of this. I mean, I would be willing to, if you would send your cameras with me, take you on a tour of the place for you to see the, the deplorable mm. condition. I mean, I've had to intervene with several people who have had to go to hospital because of re respiratory sicknesses that have come up as a way or by, as a byproduct of the amount of dust on that road. It, I mean, I've been a personal casualty to that road. I've had my, the, the, the sump of my car bust on that road. It's, it's, it's bad. And we've made several solution or, or several alternatives to government the 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 chinese contractor who is working as a subcontractor on the temahabo expansion project uses that route to cut their um, the rocks the boulders mm. that they're using and i've said to them if the government doesn't have cash let them take it as a corporate social responsibility because they're using that route so let them fix that road it won't cost them anything to fix that road they'll fix that road it's, a, it's about a 12 kilometer road they will fix it, their trucks will use it, and even as we speak, there's lots of revenue to the state because the trucks are exceeding the axle weight mm -hmm. and they are avoiding the main um, Akosombo road, which takes them through the Fenya toll road because there's an axle weighing station there. Yeah. And so they avoid it by cutting through on that rough road. And because of the size of the trucks, they're able to use the road. However, there's a danger. The boulders have, on several locations, falling out. And vehicles that are behind have been put at risk. And nobody seems to even want to explore this. Like if central government is cash-strapped, get MPS to do that as part of their corporate social responsibility because that road is serving as a critical artery to the, 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 the construction of the harbour. Again, okay. Pram Pram is one of the major places where they are winning sea sand. Mm. They're winning sand off the... And that's even bringing sea uh, erosion into Pram Pram. They're winning sand for the reclamation of parts of the sea at the harbour. And so it's deepening the, 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 the coastline or the shoreline in, in Pram Pram. So there must be some benefit to the constituency for that project because we're paying such a huge price for it. Okay. Our roads are being <laughs> damaged. Our, our shoreline, coastline is being degraded. Are these issues you are fighting aggressively? Because you are mentioning them on face to face, and I'm saying that, we I'm haven't heard you saying, saying this I'm anywhere saying, else. No, I have written letters to the minister. I have actually filed urgent questions. The minister has come and giving answers in parliament with timelines that he's not met. Okay. Last question on Ningo Pram Pram, and then we go for our first break. Two and a half years into being member of parliament, next day we are going to an election. Do you feel you've done enough? to retain the confidence of the people of Ningo Prampa? Given the circumstances, given the challenges of being a first-time opposition MP, I believe that I have, I have discharged myself quite well. I believe that my people know the challenges in given the landscape where it's a winners-take-it-all kind of uh, politics that we practice. They realize that I'm, I'm not the favorite person of this government, and for that reason, this government has also not been very uh, considerate of our share of development, but the little I can do using my common fund and personal funds, I believe that my people are confident. And, and I keep in our town hall meetings, I've been holding town hall meetings, mm. where I've been engaging the communities. I, I keep getting the, the same feedback that the people think that I'm on course. They think that we can do more together, especially when the NDC is back in power. Okay. You are listening to Sam Nati George, Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram on Face to Face. When we return, a few touchy issues to discuss, including the closure of uh, some radio stations and he's a member of the communications committee in parliament so i'll find out what he thinks about this keep watching face to face every weekday at 8 p.m city newsroom brings you analysis of the major news stories of the day in-depth comprehensive and researched it's one hour of local and international news from 8 to 9 p.m. 
It's the City Newsroom, weekdays on City TV. Yeah, welcome back to Face to Face on City TV with Member of Parliament for Ningo Papram, Sam Nati. Now, Sam, you know Radio Gold, you know Radio XYZ and all these radio stations. What sure. did you make of the closure by the NC? And I'm asking this not because you're an NDC member, but because you're on the Communications Committee of Parliament. What have you made of this? It looks like the NCA have said that, look, these entities are flouting our regulations. They are not in compliance. We are going to enforce the law. It's a good thing. Well, if you look at it just like that, you say it's a good thing. Um, the NCA, as a body, will tell you that they are exercising the powers that they have mm. by the given to them by the Electronic Communications Act. However, you don't want to go be behind that and look at what exactly are they doing. Um, the actions that we saw the NCA carry out, I think last Thursday, mm. were were arbitrary. They were high-handed. And they were very misguided and very unfortunate for press freedom. I say this because you look at the the, the modus operandi, and even if you look at the Electronic Communications Act, mm. th there are two angles to this, first and foremost, let me say. The Electronic Communications Act, there's a school of thought that says that Electronic Communications Act is an affront to Article 1623 of the Constitution. And if, if you will, let me, just, let me just read Article 1623. Okay, so. What Article 126, 162, sorry, 1623 says there shall be no impediments to the establishment of private press or media and in particular there shall be no law requiring mm -hmm. any person to obtain a license as a prerequisite to the establishment or operation of a newspaper journal or other media for mass communication or information radio stations and tv mm -hmm. stations are media for mass communication or mm -hmm. information so there's that and law. it says there shall be no law that demands you obtain a license. In fact, this was the crux of the Radio Eye case where mm -hmm. Charles Rekubrobe and Albert Kandapa were arrested by the Eswal Rawlings administration for operating Radio Eye for 16 days without requiring uh, obtaining a license from the, the state at the time. Now, it was held that you, you, you cannot impose any license as a prerequisite. However, then the state came back and said, look, okay, fine. But you are going to be broadcasting on a spectrum. Yes. And the spectrum is finite national resource. So we need you to pay for that spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so the tech word I was looking for is authorization. So not a license or authorization. So now if you look at the NCA's regime, the NCA has two charges that they charge. There's the yearly spectrum charge, mm -hmm. and then there's the license or authorization fee, which is five yearly. Mm -hmm. Now, what they are holding Radio Gold and XYZ for, and some of the other radio stations that, as a matter of post facto rationalization, they're trying to shut down, has been that they've not renewed their licenses. Yes. Those authorizations, five yearly. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. You, let's even put aside the court ruling in the radio eye that is that and the constitution that says there should be no license requirements or authorization requirements you have a license fee that i'm supposed to pay every five years and every year i'm supposed to pay a, a, a spectrum charge now i have not paid the five yearly after five years i've not paid my license renewal fee but i come back to you in year six and say i'm paying my spectrum fee and you don't demand my license fee you go ahead and, re and collect the spectrum fee from me. Year 7, I come. Year 8, year 13, year 14. And you keep collecting only the spectrum access charge. Then you come back after a number of years to say that because I didn't renew, I'm in default. Really? Is that how it works? The NCA has failed in its own work then. Then we should be holding the, the, the NCA current and past heads for causing financial loss to the state. Mm. We should hold them for a dereliction of duty. Because they were supposed to have collected a license renewal fee and a certain spectrum charge. They've been collecting the spectrum charge. Is there a reason why previous administrations had not enforced that? Yes. And look, if you go to the NTA's own website mm. and you look at stations that are operating in Accra, there are quite a number of them. And many of them are guilty of the same infraction that they claim Radio Gold and Radio XYZ are guilty of. I'll give you an example. Atlantis Radio. 
was got, got their first authorization on the 13th of December 1995. Mm -hmm. As we speak, there's been no, no license renewal. Atlantis is still on air. The that is several, what you know. As far as I'm aware, yes. And this is coming from the NTA's own website. I've pulled this detail off mm -hmm. the NTA's website. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> so uh, it's not me generating it. This is from the NTA. Okay. Um, Radio Gold got their license on the 7th of September 1995. There's been no new renewal. Um, I can use CTFM, for example. CTFM got um, its... CTFM, I saw CTFM in the list. I would find CTFM. But Adum FM, for example, got its first authorization also on the 7th of September 1995. Their last renewal was 21st um, November 2016. There, I mean, there are quite a number of them. As we speak, the BBC, for example, mm -hmm. hmm? the BBC got its first renewal or get, got its first authorization on the 19th of July 1999. Mm -hmm. There's been no renewal. So why is the BBC still broadcasting? There's been no renewal as per the document from the NCA's own website. Top FM, the same thing. Onuya FM, the same thing. Kasapa FM, the same thing. City FM, um, City FM, yeah, I sing it. Omni Media. Mm -hmm. You got your first authorization on the 28th of February 2002. Your last um, renewal was on the 27th of November 2015. So you are compliant. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not been five years since, so there's no problem with you. But the point I'm making is there are several, several radio stations I can give you. Hot FM, Happy, uh, no, Happy has done their renewal. Um, so you three so FM. From what you're saying, the NCA you feel are nitpicking absolutely, in the enforcement. Absolutely. Again, the, the show of force. Why would you go with armed policemen in the middle of, of, of a broadcast? And even when you take the Electronic Communications Act, it states that when you want to shut down a radio station, you must give them 30 days notice. The NTA didn't give any 30 days. In fact, they, they notified the night before that they'll mm -hmm. be coming to shut down the radio station. So the NTA is in itself is flouting its own laws. You ask yourself, why? Was the board of the NTA aware of the shutdowns? That's another question we should be asking. But why should they be aware of a process that should be routine? No. The board should be aware. If the NTA claims that they are doing such a clampdown, you can't do it on the blind side of your board. And I'm not saying the board is not aware. I'm asking questions. Mm. I'm saying, was the board aware? If the board was aware, can they make public that section, just that section of their board minutes, where there was discussion about the shutdown of these radio stations and the manner in which it's been done? Did the board approve of it? I want to know because of the caliber of people who sit on the board. And know if they have changed their posturing today. Because we know they are posturing in the past. And so for me, it's, it's problematic. And, and I look at this in the, largest, in the larger scheme of things. That for the first time in several years, Ghana is not number one when it comes to press freedom on the African continent. For the first time in many years, our, rank, our ranking has dropped in press freedom globally. You look at this in the light of government's high-handedness and government's boycott of several media houses simply because they've been critical of them. Really? You, oh, yes. I can give you examples. You have multimedia. Government currently, as we speak, is exercising a boycott of multimedia because a multimedia journalist... Is that a perception you have or this is fact? It's fact. Government has made Perhaps it. Perhaps government does not want to make a multi representation. Multi multimedia itself has continually stated that government is boycotting their platforms because government says that they are, they are, they are before the NMC with them over an investigative piece that was done by Manasseh Azuri Awuni. I mean, and in the past, the same Manasseh Azuri Awuni has done stuff about previous governments, the government I served in under President Mahama. We, we didn't have, we, did, we didn't treat them that way. You've seen instances where state institutions have brutalized journalists. You've seen ins instances where people affiliated to government have threatened journalists and subsequently those journalists have lost their lives. You've seen the murder of journalists and you've not seen the clampdown or a an attempt to, 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 to find who the killers are with a certain sense of agency. You see governments like a desk attitude and approach to government uh, to, to the media fraternity, the, 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 the high-handedness, what you're seeing with the radio stations. The, in fact, this whole high-handedness started as soon as this government came into office. You remember... <laughs> Barely four months into office, the communications minister said she was closing down 131 radio stations. Those stations have stayed up till now because of the advocacy of some of us who fought it and said, look, you cannot apply laws retrospectively. But it clearly shows you that there's a new culture of intimidation. There's a new culture of silence that is creeping in. And coming in on the back of the presidency of Nana Dodan a man who is supposed to be pro-media pluralism. You ask yourself, what's changed? And, I mean, he, he was cancelled to 
Mr. Charles Rikubrobe. And Charles Rikubrobe hasn't hidden his disgust for what is going on. And he's mm. asking if his lawyer has changed his position 25 years on. It's sad that 25 years after the Radio I case, the man who went to court to say that the state trying to impose a license limitation and restrictions on free media as president and his government is doing what we're saying. But you don't also think that media houses are obligated to follow processes and be compliant in the face of some of these things rather than always falling back on the calls for, okay, if you shut us down, you are hindering press freedom. Well, we, well, we cannot I, be above the law. I, I know for a fact that post the engagement with the minister mm. and the electronic tri uh, communications tribunal, that had a ruling that said that the fines that had been imposed, Radio Gold's mm. case, for example, 62 million Ghana cities were arbitrary and were baseless. Yes. Radio Gold and Radio XYZ have made attempts several times to regularize and pay the license renewal fees. And the NCA said that because you, they were in court with these institutions, they could not deal so with then, them. So then, so, then, so, then you, so then you cannot suggest that the radio stations have failed to try to do what is right. Because you see, the point here is there, was, there had been a certain culture that had happened under maybe not President Rawlings, because many of them got their first authorizations under President Rawlings, mm. but under President Kufour, there was a certain thinking that, look, many of the media houses are struggling to make overhead costs. There are several, there are several things in the law that if we say we want to implement strictly, mm. most media houses will collapse. CTFM, I drive to Ada and I still get coverage of CTFM. I drive all the way to almost Koforidia. I get to Manfi, and I'm able to get City. I'm able to get Joy. There's there's a there's a radius of broadcast requirement. You're all flouting it. So why are we not imposing punitive measures on you? We have not done these things because at the end of the day, you you also bear in mind that at times the the thinking at the time of the of the framing of the law, and the realities of operations mm -hmm. do not necessarily match. Government has a duty then to make the laws reflective of what is practical. Government has failed to do that. So the other step the government can take has always been to not necessarily seek to impose those, in quotes, draconian measures in the law because at the end of the day, they are not practical. They're not realistic. So if we have all of that debate in 2017 and the media houses are now told, look, guys, you need to pay... The, the decision has been taken by this government that, okay, President Kufour decided... I was going to go quiet. My NCA, NCA under President Kufour decided they would go quiet on the license renewal, mm -hmm. but they would insist on you paying your Spectrum fee because the Spectrum is what you broadcast on and the Spectrum is finite national resource. President Mills also decided that his NCA under him, Parag Van Persie and Co., would also not chase after the license fee because the truth of the matter is the NCA doesn't survive on this license fee. The NCA's money comes from 1% of telco revenue. That's what funds the NTAs. <laughs> the spectrum fees and license fees are, are paltry. You get mm. it. So that's not really what they survive on. It's not as though it threatens the survival of the NTA. So governments have looked at it and said, okay, this is our contribution to free media, to mm. having a, a vibrant media space. Because you may look at it that, yes, it's not much, but for some media houses, paying that license fee could be the salary of about 15 or 20 staff. And so you, you look at all of that and say, okay, pay your spectrum fee and we, 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 we turn a blind eye to the license fee. If President Akufuado has come in and he thinks that, I mean, in line with his financial management, I mean, we've even seen the National Blood Bank, we've seen Pantang Hospital, we've seen Ibibi Groma uh, uh, Dance Theatre all having their revenues being capped so that part of that money goes back to central government. We won't be surprised to see government say that they want to get from the media this license fee. Okay, that's fine. Then in that case, open a new, a new wave and say, okay, we're giving 60 days. Everybody come and do a renewal. If within 60 days you don't do the renewal, then we would enforce the law. Okay. But you don't do that. You then come and say that because the tribunal has ruled that you could not impose those fines because the licenses had technically speaking expired. So then once the licenses have expired, you're not even going to allow for renewals, but you want all of these old media houses to now do fresh applications. The processes by which you shut them down, did you go by the, what the law says? No. So what is your committee doing about this? Are you even interested in this? Oh, absolutely. We're, we're on recess at the moment, but I, I, I've, I've gotten notice that the committee will meet tomorrow. 
um, and subsequently we'll meet with the NCA and try to get to the bottom of this. But look, we just need to let sense. For want of, I mean, it's just what it is, common sense. Mm -hmm. let's, let's allow common sense prevail over partisan considerations. Okay, the minister must realize that she, she has a responsibility to the people of this country. Yeah. She she has power now, yes, but why are you blaming the minister but, for but this? The NCA would not act on the blind side of the ministry. Yes, but then the NCA also has people who know what they're supposed well, to do. Well, well, well. Why previous, don't we let the institution previous, stand previous by itself? NCA heads have attempted and written memos to previous ministers to mm -hmm. carry out these actions, and the previous ministers have stayed their hands. The Honourable Harun Idrisu. Mm -hmm. was on news file and he was former minister for communication under professor mills and he threw it at joy fm and said look <laughs> at the time i was minister there was a move to shut you down for breaching your 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 your, your broadcast regulation radius we did not we st we stayed it so ultimately policy direction comes from the minister the mm -hmm. nca cannot act on the blind side of the minister on such a major issue right. you understand and so that's what i'm saying that the minister needs to be minded that, and, and, and I, I, I'm interested in how our meeting will go tomorrow because the chairman of the committee is a media owner himself and he knows that political power is transient and that even his own radio station and media houses have not always been in conformity with the law, even when his party was not in power, but he had not been subjected or singled out for bad treatment. And so he knows the repercussions of setting this precedent. And I keep saying to people in government that power is transient. Be careful the kinds of, 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 of precedents you set. Because when you set those precedents, you are laying your own bed. People say the media, there are several media houses in this country, or more media houses in this country that are aligned with the NPP than the NDC. If the government would then decide that they are going to go by this when the tables turn. But why won't the government, why won't whichever government is in power, simply associate as an institution enforcing its rule, why must it always be seen through the eyes of a political entity? Because it's political. Because the decision to shut down Radio Gold and Radio XYZ, just those two, in the middle of broadcasting a press conference by the Council of Elders of the NDC, you can't take out politics, except you want to bury your head in the sand. All right, then. Thank you very much, <laughs> Sam Nate, George. We'll be back for the final hedge of Face to Face. We'll discuss... Uh, President Ma former President Mahama's uh, challenge of Nanado Dankwe Kufuado for the presidency of this country in 2020 and why he feels he has such a good chance. For regular news checks as they unfold, 2020 News, all day, all the time. Politics, sports, entertainment, business and more. 2020 News, we bring you the world in 20 minutes. Welcome back to the final hurdle on face to face with the member of parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Sam Nasi George. No, Sam, you're John Mahama, man. Absolutely. You, you, you say it with such a smile and confidence. 2020 is around the corner. That's what makes me smile most. The campaign is going well. He's been touring. He was in your area recently. Yeah, it was in my constituency last Tuesday. What, what was the reception like? It was fantastic. What was he saying? What, what is he um, selling that is new? The campaign has actually not started. You know, he's touring the country. That's uh, his campaign. You know, he's thanking the people. Oh. He's thanking the people for the resounding victory that they gave to him in the primaries of the NDC. And he's also thanking them. The party has not been able to go around to express our gratitude to the over 4 million people who voted for us in the general elections of 2016 even though we didn't win that election. So he's taking the opportunity to thank the people for that. He's taking the opportunity to thank them for voting for him in the last internal primaries and also using that as an opportunity to get feedback on mm. issues that affect the ordinary Ghanaian, which will fit into our manifesto. But so, he's saying a lot of things in saying thank you. That sounds like he's campaigning. Things like? Things like what he will do with free SHS and how it can be improved. Things like why the economy is not working. He's saying a lot of things. He's a former president. I mean, he, 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 he has first-hand knowledge of many of the challenges that people are facing today. It's not that those challenges are new. Those challenges existed when he was president. Mm. But he had 
a certain way of dealing with those challenges that the ordinary man on the streets did not feel it the way he felt it. I'll use my constituency for an example. Okay, when me. when he came, most of the fisher the fisher folks, we met three we, we met we met we had three different stops. And the fisher folk complained about premix. The fact that they're not getting the premix. The fact that when the premix comes is, is very expensive. The fact that they're not getting outboard engines and fishing equipment. The fact that there's no sea defense. That's and always been a problem. Weapon. No. When he was in power. And the fishermen themselves said it. That they thought they, they were not having it right under him. But they've seen the alternative. And they realized that under President Mahama and the NDC, it was way better. They, in my hometown, for example, Ahyam, which was the first stop in my constituency, they showed him an uncompleted building. Mm -hmm. That was a cold store that was being built by the local premix landing commi beach committee from the revenue they were making off the sale. That building has stopped. They've, they've actually roofed it. It's just left to the insulation. But all of that was done under President Mahama. Now, since this government came in, there's been not one Peswa from the new landing beach committee that has been formed by this government into that project or into any other project at all for development. Again, they used to get the outboard engines at very cheap prices, and it used to be staggered over a period of time for them to pay. Right now, the outboard engines don't come. And even when they come, the outboard engines go to constituency MPP chairman to do their distribution. It doesn't go to the chief fisherman. So, yes, these challenges of outboard engines have existed. But John Mahama gave a practical solution that worked for the people. Somebody came in 2016 and made all kinds of promises, very juicy and rosy promises. That they are working on. <laughs> well, I got best wife, Rihanna Pa. <laughs> right now, the clock has the, the sun has gone past overhead. We've entered, we're getting close to evening, and we have still not seen anything. In fact, it's gotten worse. You remember the same premix? What did we hear? Over two million liters of premix was diverted by the brother of the minister for fisheries, who she had made the head of the premix committee national. Is that not nepotism? What happened to that case? What happened to Nibanaman? <laughs> the ordinary fishermen are suffering. And they're feeling it. And they're telling him. So when they tell him, and some of these are things that he's had to tackle before. When the, the, the outboard engines come in, government used to wave off the taxes, the fishing nets. They used to wave off the taxes to ensure that they get them at good prices for the fisher folks. All of those things are not happening. You are imposing uh, 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 an off-season. That is important. No. When you look at the times that are being imposed for the off-season, and you look at the spawning times mm -hmm. for the fish... In Ghanaian water, because the fish is not stagnant in Ghanaian water. Definitely. They travel through our waters and they spawn at a certain time. The spawning time does not correspond with the time you are giving the ban. So you are giving the ban at a time the fish is not spawning in Ghana. But the ban and is so, based so, on so, technical data. Are you saying the data is wrong? Talk to the fishermen, they will tell you. My grandfather, my grandfather, my grandfather was a former chief fisherman. My cousins are still fishing. They know better than many of these your technical, technical people. They look at the moon and they can tell you what fish is in the sea. So are they aware that and we I'm are telling losing you, fish? And I'm telling, you, I'm telling you that when you talk to the fishermen, they will tell you that the time that we claim we are stopping the, the, the we are placing a ban, the fish is not spawning at that time. So you are not doing anything. The time you are now opening to say that, oh, they can go back and fish, is the time the fish is supposed to spawn. At that time, the fish has also moved out of Ghana's territorial waters into Togo. The only way this close season will be effective is if it is an ECOWAS decision across the borders then that way the fish can replenish stock and we would all enjoy the benefits of it but what you are going to do now is you are this you are you are disenfranchising ghanaian local fishermen for for togolese fishermen that's what's happening our government is becoming a government for foreigners either chinese or togolese now you get it and so that is how you interpret the ban on fishing oh that's what it is that is what it is because you see it is not a bad idea stricto senso however the implementation, and that's the problem of this government. <laughs> they claim they had the men. We realize they don't even have boys. That's the problem of this government. And so implementation is bad. What, what have you planned to do for, for, for the fishermen in the off-season? What alternate livelihood? This was supposed to have been done last year. You mm. stayed the decision. Over the one-year period, what consultations has the ministry done? Nothing. You just delayed it for one year, and you've come back and you're imposing it on them. Well, it's not a problem. And the fishermen know that John Mahama would handle it better. The, fisher, the, mm. the fishmongers, the fishmongers remember, they told him. They told him that under Sherry Haiti, they had met, they had sat down with technical people and developed the, 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 the Ahuto ovens, which was supposed to be ecological friendly. It was supposed to be healthy for the fishmongers. Since this government came, zilch. Nobody's even called the fishmongers. 
these are things that we were doing. These are real issues. When it comes to free SHS, the Mahama administration started the free SHS. In the 2015... started its own form of free SHS. Oh, free SHS. Right now we have different forms. Chief, whether you drink Coke or Pepsi, you've drunk a cola drink. Mm. Yes. So ultimately, we started a free SHS. And we started a free SHS by doing targeting. Today, it's just that he's not man enough to, to stick his neck out. But on this, your network, the finance minister has agreed with the NDC and President Mahama that free SHS must be targeted. Because John Mahama started free SHS in the 2015 2016 academic year, we targeted about 10,400 students. Now, those 10,400 students were the most un uh, underprivileged students in Ghana. How did we identify them? Because Ghana has a database of its most indigent people. Thanks to LEAP, Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty Program, started under President Kufo, continued by President Mahama, uh, President Mills and President Mahama, expanded under them. So we have a database of the most indigent people, the poorest people in this country, and they have children in these schools. So those mm. were the children who we targeted. What sense does it make that a family that cannot afford one square meal have a kid in school, and a family that sends their four children to Dubai and America on holidays, are all enjoying the same subsidy. And that subsidy is not sufficient enough to cover all the children. What is the wisdom in that? And these are the things that President, former President Mahama is selling to Ghanaians as he thanks well, like them. I said, like I said, we haven't even started the campaign. So if the government is getting frigid, look, we can't but, even start, but, we but can't even start the campaign because we don't even know who we are contesting. But tell me. Who you, are we contesting? You know, you uh, know. Uh, President Akufado is not a candidate of his party yet. Yet. That's, so, a fair, yes. that's, a, that's a fair he, point. He could very well be beating at the primaries because even his own party people are very, very discontent. I had the, the Eastern Regional Secretary of the NPP complaining about hardship. Everybody in the complains media. at one point in time. But let me ask yeah, you so this. Yeah, so his own people are complaining, so they may very well change him. Let me, let me ask you about. And possibly give us Baumia to, to discipline in the elections, but that's only if they would, they would, be, they would be comfortable enough to deal with Baumia. There, there, there are those who you. say that Baumia, Baumia can never lead the party. Let me ask you this. I greet you, Honorable Safomafo. <laughs> let me greet you. <laughs> let, me, let, me, <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you this. Yeah. Let me ask you this, though. What is new? You know uh, former President Mahama better than most persons. You know him on a professional level, you know him on a personal level. What is new about this Mahama? This Mahama is one who's lent, who's been toughened by the vicissitudes of life, by the, the shock of an electoral defeat, by the fact that we may have taken certain things for granted in the past. Now he's realized that every minute detail counts. Does he believe people look, would believe that he has realized these things? Well, people are seeing it. I look at, if you, if you listen to his communication, if you, if you take media clips mm. of President Mahama on the 2016 campaign, listen to his language, listen to the things he said, and listen to him today. He's saying boot for boot. Well, they're different. Completely different. They're completely different. Boot for, for boot was specific to the also West Wagon issue. But mm. I'm saying that when you take his communications, when you take the, the agency, the sense of agency, the, the candor, in, 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 in his speech today, some of those things were missing in 2016. You'd realize that this is a more focused Mahama. This is a Mahama who knows what he's about. He knows he's got four years. He's got unfinished business. He's a man with besurgent hunger. I, I mean, I sat very close to him on Tuesday. I did Adan with him. I did Sege with him. I did my constituency and I did Ponkatamanto with him. And I listened to him. I listened to him in 2016. He was my constituency in 2016. I could tell the difference. Mm. I, could, I could see a certain hunger. I could see a desire. I could see the pain he feels of having let down Ghanaians because he feels partly responsible for the hardships Ghanaians are facing today. He feels that, look, if, if we had pushed that extra mile and won the elections, Ghanaians would not have been subjected to this mediocre, incompetent government where mm. our CID of police, the head, the director general of our CID of police is now Madam Hope, Hope Tiwadu giving us hope instead of doing investigations where the presidency has now been turned into a clearinghouse for corruption. So he feels partly responsible for it. And he believes that, look, I would fix it. That's why he listened to the cry of the base of the party. When the base of the party said to him, he said he wasn't going to contest. And the base of the party said, hey, <laughs> you were responsible for the sheep. When the sheep got 
uh, 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 derailed. We're putting it back and you will take us back to clear waters. And he's taking that challenge. I see hunger. That hunger was partly, probably, probably not as much as it was in 2016. Mm -hmm. I see a resurgent Mahama. I see a Mahama who is hungry. A ha ma Mahama who wants to hit the road. I mean, he's moving. His energy levels. I, I, I see a man who thinks that he owes it to not just himself, but posterity and the people of this country to put us right back on track for the next leader to take us to our next level. Final question. I also was wondering, how has it changed you? The experiences from that day and after. You were basically the star, if one can classify it as such. How has that experience shaped you? It's made me realize that the security architecture of our country today is in shambles. It's made me realize that I cannot trust the security, the professionalism of our security architecture, sadly. And this is, I say sadly because I've worked with the security um, apparatus and I know how professional they are. I know we have very good officers in there, but we've seen a certain partisanship that's crept into our security service. We've seen a certain polarization of the security services where even long time serving policemen and military officers are disgruntled at what's going on. Because I mean, some of these men went through three years of training before they put on that uniform. And even when they put on the uniform, they are still going through constant training. And they see th people come for three weeks, as we we're told. They are taught how to use a gota phone. They are taught how to read a map. And then they are given a uniform and tied arm. And it's degrading the quality of our Ghana police service. Don't forget, the Ghana police service is, by UN standards, one of the best police services in the, in the world. Because Ghana is one of only five countries that the UN accepts its police officers to take part in peacekeeping missions. Other countries bring their military. But our police service, again, is being called into question because of the kinds of things we're seeing here. So I also, West Wogan has made me realize that under the current leadership, where you don't even know who is the Minister for National Security, is it Barney Champong or Kandapa? You saw it openly displayed at the Emil Short Commission that the, the, the security apparatus is in complete shambles. The National Security Coordinator doesn't know who he reports to. The lines of reporting are not clear. Is one a deputy minister or a substantive minister? What are their roles? I mean, analogous positions being created. The director of operations at the National Security is operating like law unto himself. The police service. The police service goes on deployment and a police officer is able to sit with a service weapon that has been issued to him. And somebody who we are told is not supposed to have that weapon can go to his car and pick an assault rifle, an AK-47 assault rifle, given to a police officer with the number of shells in it, bullets in it counted. He hands it over to the guy. The guy goes to shoot, brings it and puts it back, and nobody asks any question. And that's why you see the creeping sense of insecurity. Look at the kinds of assassinations you are seeing happening in the country. Murder. Just last week, the NDC chairman in the Apoish region. One of the consequences was, was killed on his way back from a, from, from, from a, a funeral by unknown gunmen. Ahmed Swale by unknown gunmen. The, the, the Mankralo of, my, of, of, of Pram Pram mm. killed in cold blood. Up till now, we've not been told anything. The, the, the marketing manager, pub, pu public relations officer of Ghana Port and Harbour, raped and killed. Nothing. I mean, Joseph Miguel of Ghana Water, killed. No, no, nobody is telling us anything. The CID is helpless. Because Madame Hope is not giving hope. So, so you see, it, it becomes very difficult for me with this litany of incidents that have happened, mm. states of insecurity that have happened, for us to have absolute hope in the police service under this administration. Like I've, I've reiterated earlier, I believe the police service, if allowed to do their work, are a fantastic institution. But under this administration and the kind of leadership we're seeing, the police service doesn't inspire a lot of hope in some of us. Sam Nati George, Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Thank you very much for your time on Face to Face. Pleasure. We will be meeting you again. I hope sure. you enjoyed this episode. My name is Godfrey Akutobuafa. Have a good day.